Unlike many people today, I'm an optimist. This strange condition began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on the World Web, and all my textbooks were out of date. So I told my teachers I want to quit school and begin my education on the World Web. Surprisingly, all my teachers agreed with it. And I founded a few web startups after that and discovered this wonderful internet community that runs with this crazy idea, an open, multi-stakeholder political system that still powers the internet today. Today, as Taiwan's first digital minister, I'm bringing the lessons that I learned when I was 15 years old. That's radical transparency, voluntary association, and a commitment to location independence. Surprisingly, it's working and is transforming the public service in our society. And first of all, I would like to show you my office. This is the Social Innovation Lab, and I'm at the moment here in the Social Innovation Lab in a recording session uh, to produce this hologram. The lab is co-created by hundreds of social innovators. For example, the contribution from people with Down syndrome uh, is the soccer field. You can see there's a unique geometric vision of the world. And every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. is my office hour. Everybody can come and talk to me for 40 minutes, including social workers and rough sleepers, as long as they agree to have their transcript posted publicly online. And so this combines the radical transparency methodology with the location independence. Wherever I am, I am working. In addition to those human visitors, we also have AI visitors, like those self-driving tricycles here from the MIT Media Lab. They're open hardware and they're open source, meaning that the local community can freely take it and tinker them according to our actual social needs. For example, my favorite flower market, the Jianguo Flower Market, is just across the street from the lab. As I pick up flowers, those tricycles can follow me and form an assistive fleet. And I can hop on one to carry me home after several of them carry the orchid flowers that I purchased from the flower market. So as you can see, those tricycles is evolving, co-domesticating with human beings. Now they have two eyes, they make eye contact, and they can blink at you. And so to me, AI always stands for assistive intelligence in the sense that they co-evolve with the collective intelligence into something for the social benefit for everyone. And two and a half years ago, our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, said an inspiring speech in her inauguration. She said, before, democracy was a clash between two opposing values. But from now on, democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. And indeed, in conventional thinking, social benefits on one side and private sector profits on the other, for example, are often seen as opposite and often contradict each other, forcing the government to make trade-offs. However, the idea of social innovation brings a brand new way of thinking. For people working here in the Social Innovation Lab, our core objective is achieved by developing business models to address social and environmental issues. And the government's role has changed. Instead of being the arbiter or the planner to trade between the different size trade-offs, we're now asking a different set of questions. We ask, what are our common values despite our different positions? And we say, once we have the common values, can we find solutions that works for everyone? And indeed, in the past couple of years, Taiwan has been consistently ranked as the top country internationally on open data, on internet participation, on women's digital access, digital inclusivity, and is ranked one of the top four super innovators by the World Economic Forum. And to encourage social innovation, we invite everyone to challenge or to fork existing laws and regulations and through an innovative sandbox system. Any innovator can ask an experiment for one year on platform economy, on fintech, self-driving vehicles, 5G telecommunication, you name it. Anyone can prove that their new rules work better than existing rules for everyone involved in a community. 
If the society feels it's a good idea, then we adopt this amendment as a regulation. If it's not a good idea after a year, the entire society learns something from it and a new innovator can try a different angle. So for example, with autonomous vehicles, Taiwan is the first jurisdiction in the world to legally encourage hybrid experiments of land, sea and air modalities. So it all needs to correspond to a local need for transportation. For example, the remote islands in Taiwan can really benefit from drone delivery and from self-driving ships. And finally, if the MPs need time to make this into a new law, they can at any time take the regulatory co-creation and consider it in the parliament. And the innovator then can continue to operate for up to three years or four years to serve people's societal needs and essentially becoming a local monopoly because everybody else is uh, illegal. But of course, after three or four years of deliberation, the new law will pass and other providers will enter the area. Now, the Ministry of Justice always reminds me at this point that while all the regulations from all ministries are fair game for sandbox experiments. There are two things that are outside of the scope. You cannot experiment with money laundering or funding terrorism. We know what will happen, so we don't need any experiments on those two regards. So to discover the common value in each community, I personally tour around Taiwan. So in addition to the Wednesday office hour here, I go every other Tuesday or so to the rural, indigenous, remote islands and other places to talk with the local social innovators. And all the social innovation labs in Taiwan join through telepresence. So people in Taipei, people in Taichung and so on, public servants in all the 12 different ministries involved always meet at one of the social innovation labs and they see through my eyes what the local people there sees. And the local people there also sees the central government's ministries and the public servants. Because it's truly multi-stakeholder, anything that gets asked by any innovator here usually is under the purview of many different ministries. And because all those people are literally sitting next to each other, it's impossible for them to say, oh, I'll have to consult with the Minister of Interior because they're sitting right next to them. And so they have to brainstorm among themselves. And usually, just in a couple of weeks, they have to either say, okay, we have a new idea and this will interpret the law and regulations so the social innovation can happen. Or say, oh, we really don't have an idea, so let's experiment for one year and see what happens. Almost always, 90% of the time, they choose reinterpreting their regulations. And that gives the social innovators a lot more room to pursue their innovations. And if, if they do enter the sandbox, of course, we have the demo field for the people to experience it firsthand too. So starting this March, anyone can see those self-driving tricycles and vehicles and buses and whatever uh, running around in the Shaolin Smart Energy uh, Green City. And the city is called the Taiwan Car Lab. The Taiwan Car Lab lets people like visiting a zoo see how they react to real world situations and share how they feel about it. And to listen to people's feelings, we often create an interactive survey called POLIS. And on Polis, we ask people how they feel about, for example, autonomous driving and or about fintech uh, sandbox system or about, you know, social enterprises in the law or about um, platform economy in general. And instead of a pre-written poll, any citizen can contribute their policy suggestions in a multi-week conversation moderated by an AI. And anyone in our national e-participating uh, platform, the join platform, can collect 5,000 signatures and summon me anywhere to run this kind of consultations. So we choose the focus conversation method or the ORID method invented in Canada uh, that involves four stages. The first stage is called facts where we collect evidence, first-hand experience, objective data that anyone can contribute. And then after that is confirmed by all the stakeholders, we send them out as a handbook and collect everybody's feelings about the same facts. You may feel angry, I may feel happy, and it's all okay. And after a few weeks, people eventually converge on their feelings that resonate strongly with everybody. Then we talk about ideas. The best ideas are the ones that can answer a common how my we question that address the most people's feelings. 
And finally, we hand them to the premier, to the ministers who integrate this into legalese and sign them into collective decisions. The main innovation in the police system is that they show each group how their shared sentiments are received by other groups. And because it lowers people's antagonism, because they can see that the people on different sides are actually your social media friends. You just didn't maybe talk about this thing over dinner, but they're not nameless enemies. And also, because we take away the reply button, it's impossible to make a personal attack to some other person. If you see a few sentiments that doesn't resonate with you, you're then motivated to propose more eclectic, more nuanced sentiments for other people to vote about. So instead of distracting over time, we attract consensus over time. And after we get a set of feelings that resonates with practically everybody, we always see this particular shape. That is to say, most of the people agree with most of their neighbors most of the time about most of the things. While the social media and the popular media may focus on the five things that are divisive, actually on the 95% of things, people do have a rough consensus. And so then it makes it much easier for the government to meet with all the stakeholders and check with them on the rough consensus one by one. And so by collaborating with the civic sector, we're building a robust environment suitable for social entrepreneurship to grow with the power of the civil society brought into the full play by giving the people the power to set the agenda. And in fact, Taiwan is home to one of the world's largest civic technology communities called GovZero, which started in late 2012. In the very beginning, GovZero was just a domain name, G0V.TW. And whenever the civic tech community sees anything that the government does and they want to do something that's better, that's more open, more inclusive, more collaborative, instead of protesting, they can just tell people to change the website address, which is always something that gov.tw into something that g0v.tw. By changing the O to a zero, you get into the shadow government. So in the last six years, not only the GovZero communities created hundreds of alternatives or forks of public services, but all of them is open source, meaning that if citizens think it's a good idea, then in the next procurement cycle, the government would just merge it back. And because GovZero, the logo, the domain name, there has no patent or trademarks, we see g0v.it for Italy, and we see the g0v chapters uh, coming all over the world. The inaugural object of GovZero was budget.g0v.tw that shows the national budget. There used to be hundreds of pages of PDF files, but showing them in a way, in the GovZero version, that's interactive, that's fun and understandable. Anyone can click on one item and drill down to exactly the part of the budget that they care about and start a real-time conversation around that particular budget item and the spending and the procurement and the KPIs around it. And today, in the government website, join.gov.tw, we actually merge back this civic innovation. So you can see all the hundreds of the ministry's projects all their KPIs, all their procurements, and anything that you make a public commentary will be met with real-time response from the career public service. And so in this way, when we talk about open data, we're not just talking about open government data, we're talking also about citizen science, open data contributions in data collaboratives around the entire society. So. In addition to turning budget items into social objects that everybody can talk about, people also make their own data to talk about. For example, this is the GovZero Air Pollution Observation Network. This project links the simple air quality sensors called Airbox, which is becoming very popular. More than 3,000 um, those 100 euro or so devices is applied on all the different schools and so on in balconies in Taiwan. So that all the interested people can provide real-time air quality information on their own places. And an exceptional advantage in Taiwan is the full support, not rejection, of the government. As part of the forward-looking infrastructure plan, we launched the Civil IoT program with a four-year budget of around 150 million US dollars. 
in the program, all we do is making this enormous amount of environmental data on air products, meteorology, water resource, earthquake, disaster relief, and integrate them into a high-speed computing environment. So everybody can collaboratively discover the correlation between social activity and environmental phenomena. And we use distributed ledgers, for example, to make sure that nobody can change each other's numbers. And previously, establishing effective dialogue about public policies around environment was difficult in around the world. And so we're committed to disclose all the factors related to the air quality, to the whole society, and indeed to climate change um, academic communities. And we're very proud that these related product and algorithms are applied all over the world. And so to speak, the CI project, the civil IoT project, integrates the strengths of both the government and the public will prove to be capable not only solving our own problems, but also providing such solutions to other countries in similar situations. And to that end, we hold an annual presidential hackathon. Last year, we chose five teams. There is no monetary prize. The prize is the president's promise to integrate those innovative ideas into the public service with all the political will and budget and regulations and make it happen to maximize their social impact. One of the teams last year was the Water Savior. They used machine learning to detect water leakage and they visited after the presidential hackathon, they visited New Zealand for three more months to co-create solutions to help solving the problem of water leakage there. So this year, we're also partnering with the um, TM Forum, with Open Contracting Partnership and so on, on an international version of the presidential hackathon. And through this way, Taiwan contributes our innovations, our experience to the planetary civil society, focusing not only on one or two of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but on partnership for all the 17 goals. Anyone working on any of the SDGs are asked to be indexed on Taiwan. It could be um, through a CSR reporting, through a university USR reporting, through social entrepreneurship reporting, but as long as you are reported and publicly accountable, all the resources in all our social innovation labs are yours to take. And so the idea is that by encouraging people to form useful partnerships and enhance availability of reliable data, we ensure that people can trust each other on the fact part before we share the reflections and the feelings. And once we have reliable data, we focus on 1717, which is to establish trust across all the sectors and also, more importantly, across countries. And then we also hold the focus of 176, earning this trust through social innovation that involves everybody. So think back of the self-driving tricycles. What we do here is essentially evolving a new norm, like co-domesticating a new spe species to integrate them into the everyday life. And we do so in a way that is fully participatory. Instead of asking citizens to come to technology, we're bringing the technology to the space of citizens. And this is behind Taiwan's philosophy of not just broadband connectivity as a human right, but full participation digitally as a human right. And so to conclude this talk, I would like to share with you uh, the job description that I wrote as digital minister uh, back in October 2016. They asked me what uh, would I do as the digital minister. So instead of a job description, I wrote a prayer. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always keep in mind and always remember that the plurality is here. Thank you so much. And now let's take some Slido questions.